Hey everybody, this is Big Iglovich, and uh, I'm here with the first angle cast of 2000. Let's see, what year is it now? Holy crap. Uh, 2017. Um, gosh, I thought I'd be dead by now. Surprising, kind of. Um, anyways, uh, so I've, I've been, you know, I promised this episode a little while back. And uh, now I'm finally getting around to creating it. Uh, so I ran, uh, I guess it's two episodes ago, we did a story called Bumps in the Night. I did that story and then I asked you guys to send me your comments as to why the story, what, what, what feedback you had for the story. Because I don't think the story is very good. And uh, I just wanted to see... Uh, what the rest of you guys had to say, what what was missing, what it was that it really needed. Uh, and if I had any idea what it was, or um, not. So anyways, right after I put the episode out, I got a message from a Monsieur Chris White. And Chris White, uh, he sent me this message of, uh, on Facebook. And I begged him, oh, no, 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 please, please, please send it, uh, not over Facebook, but, um, you know, record the audio of it so that I can use it on the show. And he relented, recorded the audio, and sent it my way. So my first comment from Chris White is this one. Hey, Big, good to have you back. It's nice to hear the ankle cast again. It's um, like sitting in your passenger seat glazing over slowly as the world slips by listening to your words burbling happily through me head in one side and out the other it's very satisfying <laughs> seriously it's very nice apologies in advance for any noises off there are agricultural events happening behind the house implements are being dragged up and down a field i think they're probably farrowing in the recently dead for the winter or something like that i don't know but um, i'm sure it'll all turn out fine yeah story feedback it's kind of unoriginal but you knew that didn't you nothing wrong with that it's a scaffold isn't it it's something to hang words on the important thing is that that you're writing and you write damned well if it was printed it'd be a page turner no doubt it's kind of predictable sure the monster in the cupboard it moves along you know the tension builds very nicely i've got to say just taking your idea for a little walk I thought, well, hang on, let's pick it up from the moment where he finds the monster in the cupboard. Nice monster, by the way. Oh, classic monster. Yeah, he slams the door, he opens the door, of course, it's it's gone. He closes the door. He finally realises that, yes, the thing is real and he's got to deal with it and all the rest, but first things first, his son is gone. What the hell is he going to do? He's going to do what any father would do and should do because anything else is gonna look crazy so he informs the police he lets them know as with his wife just just what's happened he goes through the forms time passes he gets depressed he drinks he wonders what the hell to do he knows that this thing is waiting in there probably for him so by now he's uh, he's rigged an alarm system on the door that'll wake him during the rare times that he can sleep should anything try to get out and cut and then looking at this kind of through the eye of a camera we see him he goes down to the cellar don't go in the cellar he's going in the cellar he goes down to the dark dark cellar and he fishes out his old shotgun. Oh dear, this doesn't look good. He comes out of the dark, dark cellar safely, cleans said shotgun, loads said shotgun, and goes up to his son's room and closes the door behind him. 
now you're describing the streets he lives on nice long broad avenue tree lined maybe and we pan down and we see the streets in the early evening as lights are coming on etc 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 swing around to the house that was a happy home that once had a wife and a son and bang there's suddenly a shot rings out cut again we we jump to the bedroom the door of the bedroom bursts open and he's standing there framed braced in the door breathing heavy he's just run up the stairs maybe looking in on his son's bedroom the shotgun on its makeshift support has blown itself over backwards the piece of string tied to its trigger is hanging slack because the other end is fastened to the door of the cupboard which is now hanging open because the weight of the body inside has pushed it open the body of the thing lying absolutely unequivocally stone dead with a great big shotgun wound in its chest <sighs> and then maybe i don't know as a as a kind of um epilogue he is bricking up the back of the cupboard in case anything else feels like coming through again i don't know what you think to that that if you like the idea then by all means be my guest it is yours um as a kind of gift for all the the happy hours you and rish have given me it's the least i can do good god incorporate it into the story if you'd like and um i'm i'm sure you'll do something wonderful with it i hope that what i suggested was useful it didn't mean to be overly critical as a piece of storytelling and, and as a piece of prose it was very nice indeed and i enjoyed it tremendously thank you very very much and uh, i look forward to the next ankle cast and the next june steve and the next that gets my goat in particular <laughs> thanks so much guys you take care farewell you know he he sent me that uh written first of all before he recorded this audio of it this idea really kind of excited me it is exactly what you wouldn't expect to happen if you know what i'm saying the last thing you expect is this guy to in the end turn the tables on the monsters and uh you know now he's got a dead monster on his hands that he can uh i don't know i guess go to the police and say hey look look this is what's going on and you know that's I'm, I'm sure one thing that would probably be a bit of a big deal in in this story um if he actually did okay now my son's gone and he's all upset and, and instead of going and and uh meeting his demise with the monster like i had it you know if he tried to tell the police oh no my son is gone and uh you know this is what happened now that his wife and his son is gone there's going to be a lot of suspicion on him um truthfully he'd probably be lucky to be able to actually go back and be at his house because they would probably be arrested anyway him killing off this monster getting evidence of the monster so that he can uh, you know take it to the police you know what's going to happen it's exactly the opposite of what you would expect you're not going to expect hey this guy has exposed closet monsters to the world or whatever um and you know it's a, it's a victorious kind of a thing it's the opposite of what i always tend to do which is sometimes fun to try and do cuz you know i don't know why but i have a dour mind that always goes to the uh you know the worst possible outcome in things or something. I tried to rearrange that with the story that I finally wrote. I finally wrote a story 
in December, and I, I purposefully tried to turn that on its head and take the expected turn of the bad ending, where it looks like it's going to be a bad ending. It looks like the Yeti's going to eat these two people, and hey, there's the end. And instead, you know, it turned out to just be something completely different. I'm not going to give away the ending, I guess, because maybe you haven't listened to that episode yet. But um, I probably said too much already. <laughs> anyway... Uh, yeah, I, I, I really liked this, and uh, when I sent him an email back, uh, I said, hey, I, I may rewrite this story and incorporate some of your stuff in here because I like the twist, and that was one of the things that I really felt that the story was lacking. You know, it's a, it's a concept that is old, 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 and tired, and, you know, everybody knows it. And I think I mentioned in the other story, or in the other episode, uh, the story that Rish did about a boy being scared of something in his closet. I can't remember what the story was called, but it was from way back when we, we put it on the show, I don't know, like 2012 or 2011, maybe even 2010, could be as far back as that. Uh, but anyways, it, was a, it turns out that it was a vampire child, and the vampire child is afraid of, like, the sun being in his uh, closet. Or there's an old English professor uh, under my bed taking the idea of a child who's afraid of things and turning it on its head so that it's the monster that's afraid of the non-monsters kind of a thing, you know. It, it was a good twist, and this is, you know, that same concept, but in this case it would be a good twist. I think I really like it, and I may actually try and rewrite this story so that it includes this stuff. I don't know, we'll have to see. We'll see what else everybody has to say. Up next, Justin Charles, who is the guy who edited the story in the first place, he had some stuff to say. He sent me a, a message on Facebook as well, saying he had an idea for the story. I asked him to please do it in audio and send it on its way to me. So he sent me this uh, file here. Hello, Big. Justin Charles here. Uh, a few ideas for your story. Um, first of all, I haven't got a fucking clue. There we go. <laughs> okay. I think that was the wrong one. Uh, that one was number one. He did. Oh, he sent me a second one. Okay, there's number two here. This must be the real one. Hi, Big. Justin Charles here. A few ideas. Um, firstly, um, he, he's... Oh, shit. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's all I got from Justin. Um, he's got a lovely accent, doesn't he? Chris and Justin both have lovely accents. I was talking about this on Facebook, and it's so unfair... I was telling Justin, you know, you hear him going, um, uh, I don't have a fucking clue. And yet he sounds intelligent. He sounds more intelligent than I would if I was reciting Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time. Uh, it's just not fair. Uh, anyways, he did write down some of his suggestions. Uh, so I guess I'll read those for you guys instead. It says, the story's great, just the very end. When you see the monster, put something like he sees his son's eyes or his wife's hairstyle. Uh, he closes his eyes and waits to be together with them. Something like that. And I like that idea too. Uh, I think it might add a little something, you know. He closes his eyes and waits for that inevitable. But instead of it just being the inevitable, he waits for, you know, he, he has some hope that he'll be with them again or... Something like that. That's, that's cool. It would give you a little something more instead of just, and he died. The end. <laughs> Which is basically what I did. So, <sighs> it would be better. Definitely. All right. So, our next comment. Whoa. I'll click back to the right spot. Uh, at this point, I'm not sure what order they came in, and I don't have a special story to go with each one of them. So this next one here says... Oh, it says it's from Marshall. So let's listen to what Marshall's ideas are for this. Hello, Big. This is Marshall. Hey, I uh, listened to your most recent Inklecast, and it's great to have you back on the air, as they say. 
um, just to hear what you're up to and uh, what your thoughts are. And, and I think it's great that you're getting back into writing and uh, willing to share stories and stuff on your podcast. It's all good. It's all good. But hey, you asked for some feedback on your story, Bumps in the Night, and uh, just writing in, in general. And uh, I'm recording this in my car because I figured, you know, it's the ankle cast. I need to record in the car, right? But uh, Bumps in the Night, I thought it was a good story. Um, you know, like you said, it is something that's been tried and uh, done many times before. I was trying to think of interesting takes that you could have t- done with done with that uh, material. And a couple ideas that I had, uh, one of them was, you know, turn it around where the dad settles down the kid and then uh, he goes into his room and is going back to sleep and he starts hearing noises and scratches and groans and, you know, something from under his bed or in his closet and he kind of pushes it away and tries to go back to sleep, but it keeps happening. And, uh, you know, eventually he's he's scared of a monster in his room. And uh, he goes in the kid's room or whatever to check on him, uh, m- mainly to get out of his room. I don't know if that's a, a good idea or not. Or, you know, maybe it's something where he calls out for his son. Um, and I guess along those lines I was thinking, too, is that, You know, maybe the, I guess the same thing, where the dad is the one being haunted, or not haunted, but uh, the one with a monster in his room, and the monster's talking to him and telling him all the terrible things that he's going to do to his kid, unless he does what he he tells him to do. Um, So, you know, the monster's threatening to go into the boys' room, and into their closet, or under their bed, and, uh, you know, maybe to drag them away to this abyss or whatever uh, type of situation. And so the dad is compelled to do whatever this monster wants him to do. Uh, You know, maybe bring him victims or point out people that he can go uh, get in their, in their bedrooms or whatever. I don't know. Uh, That's just a couple ideas that I had that uh, you you could do with a story like this. Now, I guess in saying that, you know, I don't think you're really looking to rewrite this story or not, you're not looking to polish this story up uh, to get it out there for submissions. You're just kind of getting it out there. This is a story that I wrote. Um, you know, what what kind of advice can you give me on my writing or what was good about it, what was bad about it? You know, I, I guess I'm probably not the best person to answer that question but because uh, I'm not the best writer myself. But uh, to be honest, you know, Big, I I think it's time that you uh, embrace poetry and, uh, you know, put more poetic, uh, metaphoric meanings into your writing and in in your style that you can be very uh, stylistic and artistic in your word choice and and have things layer upon each other to kind of have this subtext of a message. (laughs) I'm just joshing with you. I know you're not a big uh, poetry fan. Um, and in general, I'm not either. But, uh, you know, but I, I I guess in general, you know, writing is better if there's, you know, a, a deeper level to it or at least something that's coming from, you know, emotions or, or something that you know, comes from what it means for us to be human kind of thing. You, you can call that poetry or you can just call it good writing. You know, um, I don't know how poetic you would consider um, Stephen King in his language of, of writing, but uh, you know, definitely, you know, he he does delve into those deeper emotions. You know, I guess mostly fear and those kinds of things. And I'm not a King expert, but from what I've heard and read, you know, he he definitely gets that part of it. But anyway, this is a simple story. You weren't trying to write you know, the great Gatsby or the great American novel or anything. You're just trying to write an entertaining story um, with a a monster and a a kid in his bed. And, uh, you know, so for what it is, I I think uh, think, think it's an okay story. So I don't know, that's about it. I I didn't want to make this too long. You're probably not looking for a half-hour long comment on a a ten-minute story. (laughs) Once again, it's great to hear you back on the podcast and uh, look forward to more ankle cast episodes 
So, you know, good, good on you and uh, journey on or ankle on or what, what, whatever you're doing. See you later. At the ankle cast, Marshall, we put the cast on. That's uh, what we do. Okay, that was lame. Um, anyways, uh, thanks, Marshall, for that comment. You know, I, I, I'm not against poetic language used in fiction, and I'm totally down with that. I think Stephen King sometimes uses very beautiful language, and, and you know, I, I like a good turn of phrase. I just I don't like completely opaque things. You know, one time I read a book that was also made into a movie that was called The Lovely Bones, I believe, and that book was terrible. The woman who wrote it was only worried about the poetic language and the rest of the story was just, oh, it was garbage. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. You said for a second that you're not a great writer or whatever it was and so you, you, know, you, you shouldn't be allowed to comment or I'm not sure exactly what it was that you said, but it's something along those lines. And all I can say to that is that that is not true. Because it doesn't matter if you're a writer, what matters is if you're a reader. Everybody reads and knows what they like and what they don't like. And some things are personal preferences from person to person. You know, I like this kind of a story or I like this kind of a story. You know, my wife and I, we both love to read. We're both readers, but her tastes are basically 100% different from mine. She likes almost no books that I read. And I'm really not a fan of books that she reads. I, I tried to read a lot of them and you know, they're okay. I read a fair amount of them when we first got married. I delved into the kinds of books that she enjoyed and I read a fair number of them. And they're not the worst things in the world, but they're not my style. They're not, they don't interest me that much. And I'd rather read something that is and that does. Other things are, I think, universal. Any reader is going to know, hey, this is missing this or it's missing that. And maybe they won't know consciously, but unconsciously they realize that uh, something is missing. And if they really stop and think about it, they can probably pull it out and say, you know, I didn't like this or I didn't like that. We have first readers, people that read your story and say, hey, this is what was missing, that was what was missing. I was bored at this point. This part here was really good. Maybe, you know, more like this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I liked your ideas, Marshall. Uh, you know, the idea of switching it on its head so that the monster decides to go and now do these things to the, uh, to the father instead. That's an that's interesting concept, too. I think, I'm starting to think that that's maybe just what I needed to do. Just work on the idea a little bit more. Uh, one of the things that Rish Outfield does often, and he'll tell me about this, you know, like when we throw out prompts, like for example, the present, no one knew who the present was from. There was no name written in the box. You know, he'll take something like that and he'll sit down and he will make lists. Uh, okay, what, what could it be? What could be in the box? What's in the box? You know, he'll just keep coming up with any idea that he can think of. And then eventually, he'll settle on something that he likes. And his story's always better than mine. So, uh, it's probably a good idea, at least to spend time on it. Obviously, as we know, I have a lot of time on my hands driving to and from work. You know, I use that up listening to podcasts, sometimes making podcasts, although these days very seldomly, listening to audiobooks, etc., etc. But a time or two, I've used it up trying to plan stories out. That's probably what I should have done with something like with, with this story. It's just take it, okay, so this is what I've got. Now what am I going to do with it? What could I do? This happens and then what? I think what I did with this story was said, oh, I think I'll do it about this. And I sat down and just barfed it all out in one sitting. Just went with whatever my mind came up with. I did the Stephen King approach. Uh, you know, Stephen King is Mr. Don't have an outline, don't have a plan, you know, or else 
I don't know, you're not creative. I can't, I can't remember what his reasoning behind it was, but it's faulty. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah, had I done that, I think it might have made a big difference. Um, okay, we've got another comment here from uh, Bria. Bria Burton sent us a comment, and um, let's see what she's got to say about it. Hi, Big. I was listening to your ankle cast with, I think it was called Bumps in the Night, um, the story that you put up there recently. So, in my very humble opinion, um, it was it was a good little story. I think even though it was kind of, um, like you said, more along the typical trope of um, the monster, you know, appeared almost as expected. But um, one of the things that stood out was the, the um, background, like, vortex thing. I can't remember what you called it in the story, but there was something that was apparently going to be sucking him in whether it was before or after the monster ate him, that was, like, the question. Um, and I don't know if that's something that you would want to expand and explore. Um, that would be my only suggestion if you wanted to expand the story. But, you know, it was a really smooth read, obviously, as you were reading it. It, it went very smoothly, and um, you had some nice descriptions. I remember something was bristling. I can't remember what now, but that was just, you have some nice descriptions in there, and um, so I don't really have a lot of criticism, really, because, you know, it was just kind of a nice little story. It was what it was, and, and it didn't have this huge twist, and maybe that is kind of going against the tropes, because it seems like there's nothing you can watch or read anymore that doesn't have some kind of, like, you know, almost to the point of absurdity where these twists come out of nowhere maybe or, you know, they it can't just be a straight, you know, okay, here's what happened. And then there was a monster, like, it has to be, but the monster was the wife returning, you know, and so it, it has to be this um, major twist. It can't just be a little twist anymore. So maybe um, you can sort of get away with it because you're you're still kind of bucking the norm by doing that. So those are my thoughts. I was doing what to the norm? Oh my, Bria. So anyway, I thought it was a good story. Um, yeah, I, I, again, don't have any real criticism for it. It was short and sweet, and thanks for sharing. You know, that twist that you throw out there, it was the wife coming back. That's not bad. That's actually really good. Uh, that's a third option, I think, that could, you know, that, that could be latched onto. And one way or another, I mean, Justin kind of said something like that in his comment, where he said, you know, oh yeah, you, you see that the monster has <sighs> incorporated, I guess, the eyes of the child, or the hairstyle of the wife, or, you know, it's wearing her dress. The more you add, I guess less scary I think the monster is going to be. You see the monster come out of the closet and he's got like the wedge hairstyle, you know, where it's like comes down. But yeah, the monster comes out with that hairdo and a dress on. <laughs> Sorry, that's not where we were going with this. Um, but yeah, thanks for, for the comments. You know, it's interesting to, to hear you say that it just, it took you long and it wasn't bad and you enjoyed the language the uh, descriptions, the poetry, Marshall, of it. Okay, I've got one last comment. This one comes from, oh, hey, he was on our last show. This comes from Rish Outfield. Big, this is California Rish. Colin to tell you uh, that your story, I listened to your story, and it blows fucking orangutans. And not the uh, cute little baby ones either, that are kind of bright orange. But like the big, ugly, fat, yeah, that one. And uh, this is regular Rish Outfield calling. I, I, I had read the story years ago and take this in the spirit of encouragement rather than discouragement. But, but it just sort of ends at the point where it 
diverges from all the other stories like that. And for it to be a special story, you know, uh, um, to stand out from the pack, like you said, there are a lot of stories like this. But for it to stand out, I think it needs to continue from when he goes in there. Um, if he could somehow rescue his wife or vanquish the monster that has so upset his kid that even his job is in danger, um, then you've taken this idea, this time-worn idea, and breathed new life into it, uh, or or continued from then, you know, from that point, from from where most of these stories end. You know, obviously, the realization that the kid knows what he's talking about is where most of these stories end, and that's been done to death. Not that there's anything wrong with it. If you could make it scary leading up to that point, you know, it probably still works. But um, if that's the way you'd like to go, well, then you could find out that maybe uh, lots of vanished children or spouses or parents have ended up in this dimension or whatever. And, and I mean, this could be the jumping off point of an entire novel if you wanted to. Um, but if not, to have a sort of mini adventure in this, in this land of monsters would be interesting. And not, not in a monsters incorporated land, but in a dimension where things that don't exist on our plane do exist. And maybe, maybe you've got a really small window in which you can get back through the closet. In fact, perhaps he runs into his wife and she tells him, how long have you been here? And he's, he, you know, he tells her and she's like, run, we have to run to get back. Cause you know, everybody has seen people come through and not be able to go back because they waited too long. I don't, in fact, maybe, and gosh, now see, I'm writing the story and that's not what you want. But since I'm never going to write it, here's one more thing that I would do if it were my story. He runs into somebody else that got sucked through by one of the monsters. And that person is the one that tells him, well, you've only got eight minutes before the portal closes. So he has the choice of going back alone or with this person that he just found or looking for his wife for seven minutes. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I think you're pretty tough to put these stories out where somebody can say, you know, you know, the scrotum of a baboon. That's what I was thinking of while I was listening to your story, you know, that kind of thing. So there you go. Continue with the good work, sir. Thank you, California Rish, for your kind words and regular Rish also. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting stuff that you, that you had to say there. Similar, you know, it's it's the what we we coined a phrase, if you will, the Ian syndrome, where the story ends right where you want it to start, and you've never been more right. This is exactly the case with this story. Um, it ends right where it should be starting. It's very true. I know when I wrote this story, I was just, like I said, I think I said I, it took me a day. And I don't know if that's true, but if, if it didn't, it only took me two days or something. And I just barfed it out and was done with it because it was October. And I had to write a scary story in October because it was ox October scary story event time. And so I just did it just to say that I did it. Not because I expected something good out of it, but just because, you know, I had to. Uh, I knew you were writing a story, and so I had to write a story so that uh, people couldn't... Well, people. So that you and <laughs> nobody else participated in the scary story event. So it wasn't people that were going to say anything. It was just Rich Outfield who was going to say, You're a piece of crap because I wrote a story and you didn't, and that sucks. But yeah, if I really put my all into it, I think, yeah, I mean, the, the ideas that everybody has thrown out are really interesting. I almost feel like writing all of them, to tell you the truth. As I hear them, I think, oh, yeah, there's, 
There's another one. I, I, it could be a short story collection all on its own where I take what I've got here so far, chop it off just before we get to where we got to, and then, you know, have it go one way. And then it could be like that movie Clue where you say, oh, or it could have happened like this. And then you have it happen another way. And then, or it could have happened like this. Of course, with Clue, I think they said, but the real way it happened, and I, was there three or four endings? I can't remember. But God, that was a cool concept. It's cool that at least once that happened and worked out, huh? Um, but yeah, I think that could be done with this and it would be fun. And it would be fun, I think it would be fun to read as well. One thing that I think I've heard from pretty much everybody, I guess except for Justin, who I guess he said it in his written comment, but we didn't hear it from him. But <laughs> anyways, pretty much everybody uh, had for me encouraging words of saying, hey, no, you did a good job. This is readable or listenable uh, in this case. And, you know, I enjoyed it. Maybe it's just like all those stories where he finds out that the kid was right and the end. But at the very least, it's written well enough for what it is that you can handle it. You can enjoy it for what it is. It would be better if I'd put more effort into it, if I'd come up with a better story for it before I wrote it. But, you know, it's weird because I, the, there is no California big because big is a Californian. But yeah, when, when I, I wrote the story for our Christmas episode that we just had uh, a month or so ago, I hadn't written anything in almost a year, maybe more than a year. I don't remember exactly what it was. I think I wrote something for the ankle, something really, really small and insignificant for the ankle cast less than a year ago. But I, I'd done basically no writing for months upon months. And half of it was me quoting Marty McFly slash George McFly and saying, what if they don't like it? What if they say you got no future kid? I don't think I could handle that kind of rejection kind of a thing. But you know, I, I, I wrote that story and I wasn't convinced that it was very good at the time that I wrote it. And then I had to read the story to get it ready for the show. And when I read the story, I thought, you know what? I'm a good writer. California Big was born, I guess. I don't know. I mean, uh, as I said, Big is Californian. So that doesn't make any sense. But maybe I should call myself Hollywood Big. There we go. I'm definitely not from Hollywood. I'm not a supporter of Southern California. <laughs> Northern California and Southern California just don't see eye to eye. But anyways. Yeah, Hollywood Big said, you know what? You are a good writer. You can write well. You just need to do it. You need to do the writing and the rest of the stuff would fill in. You know what I mean? The stuff that's, that's needed, the story sense and all those kind of things. The more you do it, the better you get. And everybody knows that, including me. But for some reason, I don't, I'm not doing it more and I, and I need to get over that and I need to just do it. And I need to write more and more. I need to write every day. And I think that here and now I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it a goal. I'm going to do, I'm going to pick the Dupo Remo month because it's the shortest month of all. And I'm going to say in February, I'm going to write 500 words a day, every day. You heard it here first, folks. I just, I, it was probably dumb of me to say, but I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to make that my goal. Uh, I did it once before in October of many years ago, and it was awesome, and I loved it, and I'm going to uh, do it again. We're going to start with this February. I'm going to write every day for the entire month, and I'm going to start right now getting prepared for that, uh, getting the stuff that I am going to write ready so that when February comes, I can write and write and write and write. So yeah, at least 500 words a day I'm going to do in February, every day, because yeah, that's what I need to do. As everyone pretty much said, I, I do a good job if I do it, so it's time to do it. And uh, maybe some of these, uh, maybe I will, as part of my February writing, make a Bumps in the Night series, uh, a clue type series of Bumps in the Night stories. It sounds like it would be fun to do. 
I don't think I'll take it so far as to do a novel like Rish was suggesting, which <laughs> is it just me or does Rish suggest everything needs to be the start of a novel? <laughs> He's written a novel though, so you know, uh, he knows. Check it out on Amazon or audible.com. It's called Into the Furnace. So there you go. I think this was a successful thing. I really enjoyed this. I enjoyed everybody's comments. I enjoyed the encouragement that it gives me. I wasn't planning on writing every day in February, but because I recorded this podcast, now I do. Um, which is exactly the kind of thing I was hoping that this experiment would do. I was really hoping that I would get some kind of push to get myself going. I want 2017 to be my year. I want it to be the year where I change things, really make things start to happen. Uh, I want that to happen for me and for Rish. Coming up here soon, we're going to record a podcast where we talk about a possible Patreon account and exactly how that would work and what would be the best way to do it and if anybody would be interested in it and etc. etc. A few people have asked us to do a Patreon account, uh, which would be cool. I mean, that, that I assume means that we've got a few people that would, you know, subscribe to it or whatever you call it, support it or fund it or whatever. <laughs> Anyways, um, say more words, right? But yeah, we're, we're going to talk about that in an upcoming episode of The Dune Steve, Rish and I. Because I think that would be uh, another jumping off point to really get things changed around. And we'll see how, what, what the best way is to do it. But anyways, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end my episode now here. I am going to play my inspiring medley that I put together for this show. I put it together for my little five-year project. And shoot, am I two and a half years into that? Two and a... Two and a little, two years in a in a couple into that freaking project, and I'm I haven't gotten anywhere. So hopefully this will be the year that that'll that'll all turn around and it, and it really takes off. But yeah, I'm gonna play that because I was inspired by this process, and hopefully uh, this helps for whoever's listening as well. Um, hopefully you're inspired as well. And if nothing else, you can't not be inspired by that song and all those quotes. Man, I love it. I can sit there and listen. And I know this is probably Hollywood big tooting his own horn. But <laughs> it's, it's awesome. Uh, I think the majority of the awesomeness is Kevin MacLeod's song. But uh, you add in the com all the uh, quotes and, and, and so forth, and it's just it's inspiring, you know? It makes you want to be better, to try harder, and to do it! So, <laughs> here it comes. And thanks for listening. Thanks for your comments, everybody. Uh, Justin and Chris and Marshall and Bria and Rish. I think that was all of them, right? One, two... Three, four, five. I think that was it. Thanks, everybody, for your comments. Uh, that means we've got five listeners, right? Wow. It's way more than I thought. Um, thanks for your comments, and, and uh, enjoy the medley. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see you guys on the next show, where I hopefully will have another story for you guys to listen to and rate and comment about. See you then. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. Your goal should be a dream with a deadline. That's why I gave you five years. Do it! Do it! You miss 100% of the shots you never take. Take the shot. There will always be things in the way you dream. Don't let your dreams be dreams. You go out and you find why not. You surround yourself with why not. Live a why not life, man. There are a million no's, but all you need is 
one yes. Where we are today is where we are. Today's the starting day. I know what we're going to do today. Just do it! Do it! And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. That's all it takes to be successful is an attitude. It's an awesome feeling when you truly believe that you're going to be successful. Nothing is impossible. Dreams don't come true. Dreams are made true. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Bye-bye, boys. Have fun storming the castle. Think it'll work? It would take a miracle. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, it's funny, I meant to talk about this the last time around when uh, I talked about this story, but the father in this uh, story, his name was Ron, and his little son who kept complaining or who kept screaming for him and stuff, his name was Jeremy. Like, seriously? And nobody said anything about that. Nobody mentioned <laughs> <laughs> and the weird thing is, I didn't notice it. I wrote a character named Ron with a son named Jeremy. Ron and Jeremy. And, yeah. That's awesome, huh? I probably had to change the names around before I do the, uh, the whole story collection of these stories. Maybe I should change his name to something a little less... Double entendre.